In this episode, we are going to go over a lot of the really useful methods on the console object. The console.log is probably the number one used method for debugging in JavaScript. So by knowing what else or the other tools that we have inside that console object, we can be a lot more efficient when we go down that debugging rabbit hole with the console or even just the types of messages we display and how we display them. So let's jump into the episode. Welcome back. So the console has much more than just a log method. And by the end of this video, you will have seen lots more useful ways to use the console object than just using log. So the first thing we're going to do is show what's inside the console, just so you understand what you're working with. And if we say console, we can look at the console object. And you'll see here, there is plenty of different things in here, not just your log method that you're used to using. There's so many more functions in here. And the first thing we're going to go over is what happens when your console is messy. There is actually a console.clear command. Oh, I hit my caps lock. And that will clear the console for us. So even when we get messy after all of this, we can automate our clearing of the console as well by using a console.clear command. Or if you're just typing along, we can press command K and that will also clear the console here in the DevTools in Chrome. We are going to be working with a few dif different methods and ways of showing data. So I'm just going to set up a little user object because I'm going to use in a couple of examples through here. So I have this user uh, on my clipboard and I'm just going to paste it in. So we'll say const user, we'll give it a name, company and some hobbies there. And I'm just going to click enter. So we have that now inside our console to use whichever way we like. One of the simpler or easiest ways to make a more defined console is by using the console.warn or the console.error methods. So they're very similar to console log, except they show up in different colors and it's meant to be used to show the severity of the error. So if we say console.warn, and we say hello. We'll see we get this yellow warning. But if we, and I'm going to clear this, if we go console.error, and we'll say hello again, or actually we'll say uppercase because we're screaming this time because it's a real error. We'll see we see it in red and that error X beside it. So this can be very useful if there is an error or a warning you want shown to developers when you're in development. So I use this a lot when I'm making developer tools for teams or UI libraries and things like that, where you just actually want to give some friendly output or significant warnings to people that are going to be in the console. Now let's jump on to the next tip, and that's going to be the console.dir. Console.dir is at first very similar to the log method. So if we put the user that we had created at the start, we'll see we get an object back and we can go in and we see everything here just as if we console.log.data. So the only difference here is the console.dir showed us uh, an object first or the type. It didn't give us that pretty print or the view of it straight away. And so that's not a very useful way to use this. And where I find console.dir to be useful is when we start debugging things in the DOM. So if we were to console.log the document.body, so we can see everything there. We will get back 
a huge HTML like tree structure that we can go in and drill down and jump into to actually start debugging this. But sometimes this can be a bit messy and hard to read. So if we go into the console and dir this, we will do the same again document dot body. We will get a different kind of structure. So instead of that HTML like tree structure, we actually get a JSON like tree structure here. So we can look at elements in the page and look at the exact properties that are in the nodes here. So this can be a little bit more useful if you're more interested in seeing what events have been appended to certain elements and everything else. And you can see how long this goes on for. Next up is console.count. With console.count, we can do something which is a very common use case, and that is check how many times something has been called. And in this instance, I'm going to want to count how many hobbies we have as we iterate over them. So let's use our user object that we created earlier and say hobbies, and we can see it's an array here. And then we're going to run a for each over it. The for each takes a callback function. So I'm going to just give this an arrow function. And inside here, I'm going to say console dot count. And I'm going to give it a label, which is optional. I'll show you without the label in a second. So we'll say hobbies. And as you can see, it says hobbies one, two, and three as we iterate over them. So if we modify that and remove the label, you'll see we just get the default value. So it's still labeled, but it will be labeled with default. So I find this is a much easier way to keep track of counts of how many times things are run rather than having to create like an index variable and increment things. So I could see you using this kind of one a lot. The next console method we are going to go over is console.assert. With console.assert, we can give an assertion message if the evaluated value inside the assert is falsy. That might sound a bit confusing, but it's a lot more simple when you see an example. So let's just start build, using it once and it'll make a lot more sense. So console.assert takes two different parameters, a condition and some data. So let's first look for if a user has a specific hobby. So we can say user.hobbies.find and this takes a callback function. So we can say this is looking for a hobby and we want to check if the hobby is equal to piano. And we'll close up the assert. And then the second parameter, as we can see again, is the data. So we could say hobby not found. Excellent. Let's try this out. And as you can see, because piano isn't in our user dot hobbies, we can see we have JavaScript, guitar and pizza. So if we run that again and we change that to guitar, you'll see that the assertion message isn't shown. So there is plenty of use cases where you might not want to flood your console every time you call a function, but you might want to know if there is no value found or something falsy comes back. So Again, this is one of those ones you mightn't use all too often, but it's good to know you have it, so when you need it, you can use it. The next method we're going to go over is console.table. Console.table is definitely my most used alternative to logging out objects in JavaScript. 
And that's because it prints a nice visual table representation of an object with labeled rows for each of the object's properties. So if we say console.table and we pass this to user, you will see we get a nice, and we can actually play with this a little bit, we get a nice table back with all of the labels or the properties as labels to our object. We can even click on the columns if we want to sort by a certain column. And that's super useful if you have a huge nested beast of data or you've just a, a monster of an object that you have to go through. You can table out the data and actually explore it in a nice, easy way. So whenever I end up finding a new API or anything like that, I always reach for console.table so I can neatly route through all of the properties and everything else inside an object that is returned from an API. The next thing we're going to look at is the console.time methods. And with the console.time methods, we can timestamp to do, maybe we want to do some performance checks or we want to just see how fast something is running. What is there a difference every time we run our function? You know, this is something that I've used probably later in debugging when I'm running into performance issues or something like that. I tend to start playing with console.time. So let's create a little test timer function so that we can show you how to play around with these time methods. Let's create a function called test time. We will take an array in this. Inside here, the first thing we do when we're working with the console.time or time log and time end is we have to start the timer. And we'll say that with calling the console.time method. So that is when the clock will start. Next, I'm going to create a new array. And that is going to be created by iterating array.map, we'll say, over our, oh, this takes a callback, over our array that we're going to pass in. And we're going to console.timelog. Every time we go in here, and because the calculations don't really matter here, I'm just going to return A by A here. So we'll just, whatever the array element is, is going to multiply by itself. And before we return out of this function, we want to end that timer. So we'll say console.timeEnd. And then we can actually return our new array. So uh, this is probably the most boilerplate we'll have to write for one of these, but we get there. Oh, and I'm missing something. Oh, and I, of course, forgot to close my map. So now we should be okay. Clear this again. Test time and pass this an array of one, two, three, four. And as you can see, we get back what we expected, but what we get here is we get the benchmark. So we see each time the timer has run. Now, as you can see, if I run this again, we sometimes might get into an instance where if we don't give it labels, we might actually override another timer. So if you could think there might be some overlap. And to get around that, all the time methods actually take an optional label. So we can give this test and we can say this is the time log for test. And then we are time ending the test here as well. And not much difference in this instance, but I thought you should know it because there is instances if you're using multiple timers when you go through this that you'll be starting and stopping the default timer more than you thought. The next method we are going to go over is the console.trace. And 
This is super useful when we are debugging deeply nested objects or functions that we might want to print the stack trace of that code. So when we call the console.trace from within the function you want at the top of the call stack, you can see the exact places that it was called. So let's create a parent and child function so that you can see what happens when we call this console.trace. So let's first make a function called parent. In this parent function, we are going to create a function called child. Inside the child, we are going to just console.trace. I'm here. Inside the parent, then I'm going to call the child function. So the naming might not be great here, but let's just run this and show you what happens. And as you can see here, we can see the stack trace now of the parent being called, which then calls the child. And it's nicely labeled with the label we passed it. Whenever I've used this console.trace, I'm usually in a hellish part of debugging. So it's nice to know you have it when you do need it, because when you need it, you're going to be in no mood to want to figure out how to do this. The next and last methods we are going to go over in this episode is the console.group methods. And it's possible to group messages to avoid making a mess of our console by using the console.group methods. And we are going to group them together using them to show you how. So let's start by making a console dot group and I'm going to call this one main inside our main group I'm going to put a couple of console dot logs oh I'm saying logs because I'm saying it out loud something is going inside that log then down we will console dot log some other thing so we'll say another thing we can console dot group end. As you can see, we have a nice little grouping of the console logs there. So we can collapse this again, but we now know everything of this is tied to that main title or grouping. So we have that drop down. If maybe we don't want to take up all those lines of space, we can collapse that group by default as well. So we could say, instead of group, we can say group collapsed. And if we do that, you'll see by default, the main is closed and we have to expand it to explore it. With these groupings, you can nest groups inside groups. So let's, just show you example of that. And if I take this, I'm gonna copy this and I'm gonna clear this for a second. So if we take this and we are going to inside here of this collapse group, create another console dot group and we'll call this second. And in here, we'll just say, Hello. We can console dot group end here as well. And now let's just take a look inside our collapsed main now. And as you can see, we have our two items that we had before, but now we have this opened second group here uh, with hello inside it. So that was a ton of different console methods to go through. I'm going to clear this off now. If you found this video helpful, I'd really like if you hit that subscribe button. And until next time, happy coding.